it was nice having you as a worker. You hate your job publicly. We need to pray for him on what his next job is. He needs a job. But can you imagine if, in fact, you hate your job where you're spending the most of your life? What does that mean? At, at the end of your life, then you say, I've wasted my life. I, I was at a, a wedding this past week, flew out one day, flew back the next day. And at this wedding, I was talking to people on both ends of the uh, spectrum, age-wise. I talked to someone who is uh, just retired about a year and doesn't like it. Liked it for the first year, now doesn't like it at all. And I talked to somebody on the early stages of working and doesn't really like what they do. And the issue would be the first person said, I liked it when I worked because I was somebody. I'm not sure that I am anybody anymore. It's a pretty strong statement. And the other person said, I don't know that I really want to sacrifice my, the way I look at my life for this 90 hours. The question I ask is, how do you look at work? How do you look at it? What do you do with it? And, and how do you think about it? And, and, and candidly, the question is, as Christians, this wasn't just a Christians, obviously, when they say 80% of people hate their job, hate their work. What does God say about it? Okay, does God say anything about it? He does, actually. There is a biblical theology of work. What's a biblical theology? How do you think about it? And, and the first scripture you need to know is this one. You need to receive this and understand it because this scripture is denied by our world today. The basis of understanding of work is denied by this. God says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work on it and keep it. The second chapter of the Bible is that work was before the fall. Work was before sin happened. So part of work, intrinsically, God worked. And we are in his image, we work. So work is not inherently evil. Understand that. It's not inherently evil. You've experienced this, right? You've experienced it in your own life. Being back in the Midwest, you know what I like about the Midwest? I like the smell of the Midwest. The smell of cut alfalfa is a, is a great smell. And I remember a kid, as a kid, working on my uncle's farm, baling hay, and working stinking hard all day long, trailer after trailer of, of bales of hay, putting in the upper uh, loft of the barn, and going to sleep. You ever slept, you ever just sleep so hard you don't even move? You just fall asleep and you wake up and you're in the same spot because you have just... But there's something about the accomplishment of work that inherently says that's what we're made for. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden to eat and to work and to keep it. So work is not evil. The idea of work is part of meaning. It's why we are here. So, and candidly, work is not a punishment for the fall. It isn't as if they didn't work before the fall and then the fall into sin and then they worked. But in fact, sin does have consequences. Sin has consequences to people, has consequences to creation, has consequences to work. And, and this scripture is important. Genesis 3. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, God is speaking to Adam, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. What does that mean? It means farming was easier before the fall. Thorns and thistles did not exist. There's always a debate. The debate is, were there mosquitoes before the fall? I don't think so. No. And, and what did not exist? What did not exist is this whole issue of thorns and thistles and weeds. I don't like weeds. I'm impressed with them, but I don't like them. Because ultimately, I never have planted a weed in my entire life. And it comes up. The fascinating reality is a weed can grow up in the weirdest of places. In the middle of a crack, in the middle of your, of your sidewalk or your driveway, it can come up. And it is resilient weeds. And the interesting thing is weeds have made farming so much more complicated and more expensive, actually. The fall into sin creates more effort and work. You know what this is? This is a, the inside of a combine. 
The inside of a combine, years ago, you simply had a tractor and a plow. Now, combines have electronic brains. And so the spot over which this combine is, you're going to plug in, and it's going to say, the last three years, it was this kind of yield. It was this kind of moisture. It was this kind of soil. It was this kind. And you, therefore, put the right amount of pesticides and, and fertilizer and chemicals on that spot to do the very best. What is that needed for? Why is a $330,000 piece of equipment now used? Because it's trying to mitigate the result of sin. So here's the concept. Work is harder. Your work is harder because there's sin in the world. Whatever it is, whether you grow something, whether you manage some group of people, whether you're doing something, it's a result of sin. But, but work itself, though harder, is not evil in itself. In fact, God says to us, for even when we were with you, this is what we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. How many of you had a parent who quoted this Bible passage to you? Right? Right. So my brothers and I, we had chore charts. Any of you had to, any of you had to do the dish? We had three dishwashers in our house, David, Jeff, and John. We had no, we didn't have that. And then the drying thing and picking up after the dog. I personally think the dog should learn to pick up after itself. I mean, uh, as a kid, I didn't really want to have to pick up after the dog. I didn't want the dog that much to want to pick up after it. And, and the issue of, uh, and we had to mow the lawn. It would have been okay to me to have, just let it go. I didn't need to mow it. I didn't have, have no emotional need to do so. And so ultimately, my mom would often, if we did not, there was a chore chart, which was the calendar with our names on it. Uh, and, and ultimately, as I... It's been such a long time, but I can remember the feeling I had standing in front of it and saying, I did not do what I was supposed to do. And she would quote this passage before supper. If you didn't work, you're not going to eat. Now, my personality is, okay, <laughs> I'll make something myself. Uh, if I can get out of it, is. And sometimes I would check and see, what are we eating? Uh, is it worth it to do this? Um, and all of that's not right, but that's what I did. And, and so I would, and then, then she would, no, I said, you're going to eat, she said. You're going to sit at this table. And it does not, and food does not get warmer over time. And sitting at a table hoping that it's going to get warmer, hoping the dog will eat something as you drop it on the ground, make some benefit of that dog, the, it didn't, didn't work. Here God says, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now then that are such we command, they work and eat their own bread. Working is part of what we ought to do. And in fact, scripturally it says, and as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. What's the right thing? So some of you here, I see you are students. You know you have a job? Your job is to be the best student you can be. And you know what? Sometimes they're going to make you do busy work. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hated it too. I get it. But you still got to do it. Do the best job you can. Because ultimately, if you're a student, that's your job. Your job is to do the best you can. If you are, whatever you're supposed to do, in fact, never tire of doing the next thing. And go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in the summer and gathers its food at the harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard, when you get up from your sleep? I'm impressed with ants. There's no, like, ant commander contrary to the movie A Bug's Life, there's no ant commander that says, go and do this. It just does it. Stores its provisions in the summer. It works hard. You know, I, I've long been fascinated by ants, and this, uh, we live, this place right here is right next door to the Jump Central place over there, or the altitude, and I was picking up some trash there during summer camp, and I saw this. This was uh, on the light post up off the ground a little bit. It was, uh, it's an ice cream. It was from Dairy Queen. And it is filled with ants. See it? All ants. Those are not, those are not sprinkles. Those are ants. And, and these are ants. These are the ants that were coming. The, high, the super highway of ants that was coming to this thing was absolutely amazing. Now, personally, watching ants is much better than any television show ever. And so I felt bad. I thought, i got to pick up this, but I can't pick up this because they spent so much time finding it and they're going to clean it out, and eventually they'll be clean. So I left it, and I came back later in the day, and I picked up the trash. I felt, I felt a moral obligation to help the ants. They felt so 
So you think that's not true. It actually is true. Um, and, and so, like, when I was a kid, we had an ant farm in our house. Do you have an ant farm? Those plastic green things where you have the ants? And, and in our neighborhood and on the farms that I would go to, they had huge ant piles. And the best thing, most fun thing you're ever going to do is you take a Jolly Rancher. You know what a Jolly Rancher is? A Jolly Rancher is hydrogen and palm oil and high fructose corn syrup in a little square. And if you get it wet and you stick it right outside, the question is how long will it take the ants to pull that in? It's incredibly fun. You should do it. And, and the, how many ants does it take and how long does it take? It's pretty amazing how strong ants are. And it's pretty amazing how resilient they are. And God says, we're supposed to be like ants. It has no commander, no overseer. Nobody says you got to do it. Yet it does what it's supposed to do in summer and gathers and harvests. Diligence. He's saying, he's basically talking about diligence because work is a sacred calling. Sacred calling. What you're doing about your life. But consider this for a moment. If you're one of the 80% of people who hates their job, hate is a pretty strong word hate their job basically they're going to say what's what's my life for this the scripture is an important one whatever you do work at it with all your heart as working for the lord not for human masters now apart from dave who clearly hates his boss i guess uh, so <laughs> apart from dave he said dave we need to have some reconciliation any of you a reconciler okay you repent you that's the second time you said that you, did you not mean it the first time what's going on okay got it there you go. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Actually, Dave is a hardworking person. He's a very hardworking person. He, his language of, if you told him don't work, it would be difficult for him. I, could, I can make Dave be uncomfortable. Two things. Dave, you will, never, you will never eat again at this place. There's no more, food for you, no more food for you. He would quit. And if I told him he, could, he couldn't just work, he, he, is, he is geared and wired to work. As since you know that you're receiving an inheritance from the Lord, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. All of us have worked for someone that we thought, okay, if they didn't acknowledge us, if they didn't clap, if they didn't say any words, we were less productive because of their absence of words. The point is, it really isn't about them. Maybe you right now are working for the best boss you've ever worked for, or maybe you're working for the worst boss you've ever worked for. So... You're really not working for either of them. You're really working for Jesus. It says, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. It is so amazingly free to simply say, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do, Lord, for you, for the very best way I can. You know, as I was, uh, as I was trying to get home on Friday night, I, I left the, after the wedding, got on a plane at about 8.30 in the evening, I was supposed to pick up a, a, a plane, a connecting flight in Denver, and then a connecting flight to Phoenix. We'd get home about 11.15 was the goal. And um, I'm one of those people who watches where you're flying. Do you do this? Maybe you don't. Uh, you should. And uh, I, I watch where you're flying, and so I'm, I'm watching, I'm watching the, the, little, the little itty-bitty plane as it flies, and it's going past Denver. I'm thinking to myself, wait. I have an overactive sense of responsibility, as always, and I, I feel the need to tell the pilot he's missed Denver. Uh, uh, we were supposed to land there because I have a flight to catch there. And, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm just about ready to push the button to talk to the, the, the person, and the person comes over the loudspeaker. If you're one of those people who is watching the map, I'm thinking like, they're watching me. And I go, and you've taken notice that we have passed Denver. Yes, we have passed Denver. We are now landing in Salt Lake City. And I go, wait, I'm right, and I don't like being right. Ah! And, and then he, he has a pensive pause. Whoever the guy was, brilliant, uh, funny person. Because he basically, and then he, he waited a couple of seconds, and he goes, because there were tornadoes in Denver, and we thought you probably didn't want that. <laughs> so we went to Salt Lake City, landed, got fuel, flew back out to Denver. By the time we got back to Denver, it was 2 a.m. And then at 2 a.m., you ever been in Denver airport? Denver airport is a zoo. Okay, Denver airport is like seven times bigger than our airport. 
crazy, lots of people. And there were about 2,000 people running around at Denver Airport at 2 a.m., all of which are trying to find a new flight now because it's all been disrupted for about four hours of time. And, and so I get there, I'm, uh, it's, my flight now doesn't go out till 3.30 a.m., and it's now 2, and it's th 2 to 3.30, I think, I need to entertain myself. And so I post up next to customer service because there are 112 people in line and there are probably nine customer service things, but I want to hear the interaction of this situation. I just want to, I just want to, I want to understand. And no offense, if you talk loud enough, I can hear you, I'm going to listen. Sorry, because I'm doing, everything's a sociological phenomenon to me. And so, so there's a young man in the front and he is ticked off, he is angry. And there are 112 people in his line. And he doesn't get his issue solved for 32 minutes. You say, how do you know that? Because I wrote it down. I, I got it. And I'm thinking, like, if 32, if it takes every person in this line for 32 minutes to get their issue done, they're not getting out of here till Tuesday. It's not going to happen. And eventually, the poor young man on the other side of the counter, they were screaming at him and yelling at him. And in my heightened sense of, uh, I, had a, I had this on. And I, I thought, you know what? I need to kind of, like, stand next to some people. And just, and just say, you know, maybe they have, and I, wanna, I wanted to go say, um, you know, please, may, I don't know how many times I was called father, father, you know, I, I said, you know, I, I'm not going to, I am a father, I have three kids, and the, I said, okay, and I said, I, but he, that poor young man, for the hour and a half I was there, and he had only gotten through in an hour and a half, 12 people, um, he was being yelled at the whole time. And ultimately, he had a great idea. He had a great attitude, actually. The question is, if you look to your situation and your circumstance and say, that's how I'm going to view my life, I, I say this to you. Whatever you do, Jesus is your boss. Work at it for him. When you wake up in the morning, you're serving Jesus. Because... The people you work with, they're serving Jesus too. Whether they understand it or not, it's the Lord Christ you are serving. It is much more free, and you say, God, I'm going to give you my best today, whatever that is. And maybe I don't have any energy today, but I'm going to give it to you. But the statement here is not only is it for God, it's for others. It's for others. Your life is not about you. It's not about how much stuff you can amass. It's not about stuff you can gather and hold on to. It's for others. And, and as an example, I'm, I'm grateful for those of you that take the time, effort, and energy to help us give food to others on, on Wednesday morning. There's something as simple as 1,200 people a week receive food that feeds their family for a week. That's a, that's a pretty simple thing, but pretty profound thing. I pray that as people drive past this place, they will say, this church, this school, this entity is for others. It's not for ourselves, it's for other people. That's what we're here for. Your life is for others. And, and I, I want to say this to you because sometimes we say, well, what's my worth? What's my meaning? What's my value? What if people don't clap for me in my, my effort? I'm going to say this. God's economy is different than other people's economy. And as you were coming in today or maybe after, you got one of these. And I want to say to you, the work we do together is not just the task of giving out food, but the work we do together is praying, that we gather in prayer together. We gather to lift one another up. And, and I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know specifically, and if you have a prayer request that you would like to give, there's someone in your life that you would want to agree with us in prayer, please pass it to these gentlemen who are here picking them up. And, and the intention is, don't misunderstand. The most significant thing most of us can do in any given day is to pray, is to call upon God. So no matter how old you are or how young you are, how much energy you have or how much energy you don't have, you can do what this says, to devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Why? Because we are here for others. We are here for you. And the intention here is that our ministry, our work together is spiritual. It's not just what 
happens for children's lives, it, what happens for other people's lives as well. We continue to pray as a body of believers for so many people. But the scripture that God says, what's our attitude about our life? And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, whatever you do, in what you say or what you act, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's no wasted days. This is a spiritual day. Tomorrow will be a spiritual day. And you have people in your life who need you. And if for no other reason, you can pray for them. And you can tell them you're praying for them. That they know that they are not alone. Imagine for this, how many people do you know? Who in your life, don't ask them this question, but think about it. If 80% of people hate their jobs, how many of those are the people you know? That's a pretty strong statement. That's a spiritual battle. Because then people feel like their life is wasted. What am I really doing with my life? That is not what God intend. God's intent, ultimately, is that you and I would not waste our work. The battle is not how many hours or how many less hours. You need to have a rhythm of, of health. But it's more significant of in your mind. How do you look at it in your mind? Because... You can have a poor attitude about your job if you work way too much or way too little. But God says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I say to you, you matter. You're here for a purpose and a meaning. And the thing you're doing, I'm going to say this statement, it isn't as if I'm the only one, or anybody who works here is the only one who serves God. We all serve God. There is not something that's sacred and something that's not sacred. Whatever we do, when we do it in the name of Christ, for the power of Christ, for the glory of Christ, that is spiritual. That is true. And as we close today for others, as we close today doing the work of praying for others, please join me in prayer. Please remain seated. Lord God, we pray for a family to have patience and understanding. We pray for Zach Tullis for complete healing and for his wife, Lindsay, for strength and endurance and peace. We, we pray for Mother Catherine, Brother Larry, a daughter, Catherine. Pray for health and be able to progress with surgery and in recovery. We pray, Lord God, for your grace and your strength to be thankful for all things, for salvation, for a family. We pray for a mother's health, that a father, surgery, recovers and pray that God helps push through the difficulties in everyday life. Lord God, we pray for peace among travelers and safety for journeys. We pray for, to motivate and task to be successful in getting skills to maintain employment. We pray for these struggling with mental illness. Pray for people who are having a hard time Pray for a brother and for his, for his cell, his safety. We pray for a young father who just lost his wife. Pray for a father who feels stuck in a dead-end job. Pray for a family that's going through difficulties today. We pray for our kids' salvation. We pray, Lord God, for a that love would be shown and our actions and thoughts and your will would be revealed. We pray for a family that's going through a divorce. We pray for healing, for Steve, for comfort and peace, for his family, for salvation, for Chris and Mia, that God has given that you share with others. And for Stephen and Danny's surgery, we pray for Ashley and Christian to come to know you. For Jennifer, for recovery, for surgery, for Thanksgiving, for no cancer. We pray that this person would use a holiday to rest and praise you for the time to rest. For students and their families to rest and enjoy all the time to know you. We pray for those that, who are experiencing challenges to see that God wants them to trust him and come to him. We pray for good health and clean scan. We pray for a friend, Jess, who's pregnant, and for a dad. Gracious God, give us your thoughts about our lives. 
May we see things, that we do all things for what you have desired. On this Labor Day weekend, we thank you for the gift of meaning and purpose in our lives. We give you thanks that we are able to do things in your name and by your name. And we gather all of our prayers before you in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. confess to God that we have all sinned and we all fall short. That's why we need the sacrifice that took place at Calvary so many years ago. We invite you to sing with us as we prepare our hearts for this day. Lord, I give you my heart, give you my soul. Lord, have your way in me. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. This want you to know today without a shadow of a doubt that you are loved and you are forgiven and he paid an extraordinary price for us at the cross in order to purchase our salvation. Pastor Jeff talked about way back in the garden in his message today and the relationship between God and man was, was broken because of disobedience, because of sin, because of rebellion. But at the cross that relationship is restored and God wants you to know today that you are the object of his affection and that he loves you with an everlasting love, a love that is hard to even comprehend, that he would send his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on a cross. The Bible says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. It's higher than the heavens are above the earth. And today, we're going to celebrate that meal. Jesus said, do this to remember me. In other words, participate in this meal to remember the sacrifice, and when you feel down, when you feel discouraged or overwhelmed or frustrated by your life, you can cling to this one thing, that God loves me, God forgives me, and God is for me, as the Bible says in Romans. And so we like to say a creed in order 
that we would all be of the same mind and the same belief regarding this supper, that it's incredibly important that we examine ourselves. And when we do so, we will find that we have all fallen short. And we have all not lived perfect lives. There's only one who lived a perfect life, and that was Jesus. And today, in the breaking of the bread and in the pouring out of the wine, we are to remember a sacrifice made 2,000 years ago where the body of Jesus was broken for us. Incredible. And the blood of Jesus was poured out. I'd like to put the words of the confessional creed on the screen. And we do ask that if there are children here, that they would go through the confirmation process so that they're fully aware of what this meal is all about. Uh, but if your belief, if your confession is that you have sinned and you need a Savior today, then, and you agree with this confession, then you are welcome to come to the table of the Lord. Let's pray together. I understand and admit that I have sinned against God. Today, I recognize my sin and humbly ask God to forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and that he is my only hope against sin, death, and the devil. I believe that the risen Christ is really present in this sacrament and under the form of the bread and wine, I, his true body and blood for the forgiveness of my sin and the strengthening of my faith and life. I promise to dedicate my life to the Lord and his church by faithfully worshiping him, cheerfully giving my time and resources, and joyfully sharing the good news of Jesus with others. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had broken it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you, for the forgiveness of all your sin. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had taken a sip, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this cup, every one of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of all your sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Communion assistance, if you'd come forward at this time. Savior, I come, I quiet my soul, remember, redemption's here, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom, and everything I once held dear. I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Bye. 
knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to cross where your love poured out and bring me to my knees lord i lay me down rid me of myself i belong to you oh lead me lead me to the cross God, we thank you so much for this gift this morning, God, this incredible 
offering that you have given to us, your very blood poured out for us. And God, it's because of that, it's because of the love that you have for us that we want to please you, God, that we want to work as though you are our boss and not um, the humans around us. And it is your sacrifice, God, that enables us to even understand that a little bit. So I pray this morning that as we have been re-strengthened and renewed, God's scripture says that in rest and repentance is our salvation and our strength. And so we have repented and you have responded, God, and you have been so good to us. So I pray that our souls would be at rest, God, that our minds and our hearts would be at rest even when our bodies are working. And that, God, we would have a clear vision for exactly what it is that you are calling us to, God, for the places where we're confused about our vocation or what in the world are we supposed to be doing, God, we trust you to make it clear in your time. And we thank you that, God, you don't just come to us in this meal, but God, you are with us and for us every single minute of every single day. And because you loved us first, God, we want to love you in return. So we love you. We thank you again for this incredible sacrifice. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. It gives me great joy to announce that your sins have been forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed at the cross. Amen? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, I have to first of all uh, apologize and repent for talking during the sermon. I, above all people, ought to know better. So uh, I am a sinner. I need grace. I need Jesus. So I just proved that. Uh, very, very plainly today, so I beg, I indulge, I pray for your forgiveness. <laughs> so I, sh I know this, this is the way Pastor Jeff works, I'm preaching next week, he's going to be heckling me the whole time, I just know he has to up it just a little bit. Uh, just a couple announcements to share with you, next week we're having what we call a ministry fair, and you might wonder, well what in the world is that? Out on the patio next Sunday, we're going to have tables set up with people in this church who are passionate about some ministry here. It might be women's ministry, um, Stephen's ministry, men's ministry, uh, Christ Cares for Kids. Um, there's somebody who is very passionate about Valley Lutheran coming, Habitat for Humanity, and our goal is to try to get you connected. You can see the, uh, the, the screen there. And so I pray that you don't decide, well, I'm going to go out a different exit so I don't have to go past those people over there. Really, our goal is to try to help you do something that has eternal value with your one and only life and that you would invest. And Pastor Jeff talked about it today. Uh, don't waste your work. We're going to all appear before God someday and have to give an account of our life. We want to connect you with a ministry that you're passionate about. This is not going to be something that you can't stand doing. This is going to be something that God has uniquely designed you to do with your life. And uh, Julia and Joyce will be in the back on a table at the opening, uh, the entryway to the Life Center, ready to sign you up if you have a ministry that you want to promote. Um, also, Pastor Jeff mentioned this. Thank you for the help with the food. 1,200 people a week is, is an incredible feat. We could not do that without you. And so thank you for those who come early and bag and box food and then distribute it as well. It's, a, it's an incredible gift to our community. And this is probably the, the announcement I've been waiting for, all for the service. I am a new grandpa, along with my wife, Julia. Our daughter, Ashley, had a little baby. And we thought we'd give a 10-second preview. Uh, Julia has 200 more pictures that she'd like to show you after the service is over. You're more than welcome to talk to Julia. But this is a little video of Lincoln. He does make some fun. Wait for it. Yeah. That's not it. Mm. 
I'm waiting for him to smile. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, oh, he it was worth it, right? That was worth waiting for that. So praise God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Just absolute miracle. And I think those of you who are grandparents, you probably get this. You get this completely. Um, I think we have one final song. We no, no, we do, we do. Well, receive a blessing from the Lord in that case. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give he, you his deep abiding peace that will sustain you through all of life's challenges and difficulties and storms. Let's stand for our closing song, Lead Me to the Cross. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.